controversy surfaced. State Representative Deborah Silcox admitted during a recent committee hearing that she consulted with one of the companies last year. Cannabis companies was unlawful, corrupt, and rife with conflicts of interest and fraud. But we have to make sure the process is done in a fair way. Last year, the Georgia Medical Cannabis Commission awarded potentially lucrative licenses to six companies to grow and sell medical marijuana. For two years, the I-Team has investigated the awarding of medical marijuana licenses in Georgia. We've exposed controversial corporate backgrounds involving four of the winning bidders. I was a consultant on uh, with one of the companies that was applying um, in this past year. Then another bid controversy surfaced. State Representative Deborah Silcox admitted during a recent committee hearing that she consulted with one of the companies last year before she was elected in 2022. What kind of help? Just advice, advice. I mean, I know the legislative process, so just advice. She I exercise poor judgment by contracting with a company that is owned by my political donors and is regulated by an agency that was under audit by my audits division. Anything else? I am sorry for harming the trust that I and so many others have worked so hard to build. Earlier this week, that's after Queen Six learned the Secretary of State was contracted to work for the cannabis company. Now, the Secretary of State's office confirms, based on emails between Shamia Fagan and the LaModa CEO, Rosa Cazares, that it appears as though the Secretary of State shared her draft of the audit plan on the cannabis industry with Cazares for feedback in January of 2021. So here we have a Yuba County deputy accused of transporting hundreds of pounds of pot to Pennsylvania. We have seven Baltimore City police officers arrested for abusing power in a federal racketeering conspiracy. Officers allegedly robbed victims, filed false affidavits, made fraudulent overtime. Happy Friday. I get asked all the time for an update on the creepy cop search case out of Putnam County, West Virginia where plainclothed police officers from the Sheriff's Department's Special Enforcement Unit were caught on hidden camera literally breaking into my client's home, sneaking in through the window, searching the inside of his house for non-existent drugs. To see footage of police officers secretly inside someone's home, where there's no criminal investigation, much less criminal charges, it's just scary, especially where there's no legal justification for them to be there. You're looking at a text exchange between a Westland police detective and the owner of A&B Towing. They're accused of working together to get an African-American man arrested in 2017 because a close friend of then police chief was worried he might sue the towing company for racial discrimination. Rocking the city and police department. A total of eight officers on BPD's elite gun trace task force were convicted for racketeering, robbery, extortion, and overtime fraud. The officers admitting to flaunting and abusing their power for almost 10 years, using their badges to commit crimes. They stole drugs and money. Members pled guilty to robbing citizens during street and traffic stops, making illegal searches in people's homes, planting evidence, and providing false affidavits and police reports to further their crimes. In some cases, the group made arrests based on bogus charges that resulted in people being sent to jail for years. Now they're the ones serving time. Okay. A former sheriff's deputy will spend the next few years behind bars for using his own uniform and badge to take part in a heist that seems like it was made for the movies. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office, 43-year-old Mark Antrim and six others robbed a warehouse in downtown Los Angeles of $600,000 in cash and 1,200 pounds of marijuana while pretending to be deputies executing a search warrant. The total take of the heist was more than $2 million. Antrim pleaded guilty to five counts against... Outraged over a 911 call. He wants to know why no charges have been filed against a police officer who admits to confiscating marijuana from suspects and then baking it in brownies. I think I'm having an overdose of this so is my wife. Overdose of what? Marijuana. I don't know if it had something in it. Can you please send rescue? Did you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just... I think we're dying. Oh, how much did you guys have? I, I don't know. We made brownies. And I think we're dead. Time is going by really, 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 really slow. <laughs> From drug bus to saving puppies, Oregon State Police celebrated the work of Trooper Travis Peterson. His accomplishments posted on social media. 
But now, this drug cop from Southern Oregon is attracting attention for another reason. Allegations of misconduct. Travis Peterson has been racially profiling on Interstate 5 and throughout the roads of Jackson County for years. A review of press releases and social media posts suggest over the past few years, Trooper Peterson and his canine have made numerous drug busts along Interstate 5 near Medford, seizing cash, cocaine, heroin, and meth. But court records indicate many of those cases were later dismissed because the trooper allegedly conducted unlawful searches. And there were other problems. A memo from the Jackson County District Attorney shows Peterson failed to document hundreds of traffic stops. He didn't record some canine deployment, which impacts a dog's accuracy rating, and some evidence went missing. He did hide his stops evidence. He did hide his canine stops. They do continue to employ him. Tonight, we expose allegations of a widespread conspiracy. This involves drugs, corruption, and a cover-up inside many law enforcement agencies. For months, we've been digging into accusations that officers and deputies in the Bay Area have committed hundreds of acts of extortion, theft, even robbery. Four years ago, when he says he found himself at the center of a bizarre crime and cover-up. This is where we pulled off, and this is where I was robbed, right here. When he saw flashing police lights behind him, he was being pulled over. He says the two men identified themselves as federal agents with the ATF. One of them asked Flatten if he had any money or drugs in the car. Flatten told him he had a doctor's note for medical marijuana. And he goes, oh, that gives us the right to search the vehicle. And right there, I just shut up. I, I knew that they don't have that right. They don't have a search warrant. Flatten tells us the men found three pounds of his marijuana, then took a picture of him and his driver's license, then drove off with his weed. Oh, I, I knew immediately that I got robbed. Now it was who did it and how are we going to uncover this? Flatten filed other people with similar stories, then sued Ronard Park. The city decided to settle, paying out roughly $2 million, but never admitted any wrongdoing. Police corruption and marijuana have been intertwined in a complex relationship for decades. This video series aims to shed light on this issue, focusing on police misconduct and specifically police misconduct related to marijuana. Police corruption is a form of police misconduct that involves the misuse of authority by a police officer in a manner designed to produce personal gain for himself or others. When it comes to marijuana, police corruption can take many forms, including planting evidence, falsifying reports, accepting bribes, ignoring illegal activities, or helping to shut down the competition. In many police misconduct cases, individuals have been wrongly arrested or convicted based on falsified evidence or testimony. And this not only destroys lives, but also erodes public confidence in the police and the justice system as a whole. In 2018, Christina was an administrative assistant. Currently, she is the supervisor, licensing compliance and policy supervisor. This 
press conference you're about to see took place on April 11, 2022. At the exact same time this press conference was being held, I was two blocks away at the Multnomah County Courthouse being prosecuted on felony charges based on fraudulent paperwork that Christina Corse and Rosa Cazares cooked up so they could steal my location on Sandy Boulevard. Let's listen. That people are still suffering from an antiquated law that we changed years ago. When it comes to expunging past cannabis-related criminal records, this should not solely be the work of the city of Portland. We need the state of Oregon to step up and expunge previous nonviolent cannabis-related convictions from all people's records. For social equity, CPOT strongly recommends that the city eliminate systemic, discriminatory, nonviolent cannabis criminal records by developing a city-led and funded expungement program. And I'd like to echo the Honorable Commissioner Hardesty and the fact that in 2014, almost 3,200 days ago, the majority of Oregonians, over 800,000 people, voted to end cannabis prohibition because of the disproportionate impact it's had on black and brown Americans. The fact that we don't have an expungement program yet is something that the, the state needs to pay attention to and, and deal with immediately because only then we'll start to have restorative justice. Good. Seven years ago, to support the new program, the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team was founded and formed. And to their credit, like I said, this has now become a benchmark at a local, state, and federal level. I also want to quickly just acknowledge the team. Uh, you know, before I started, it, this program was without officially a leader um, for several months, uh, almost a year, but under. Under Christina Corse, our licensing, compliance, and policy supervisor, we've been able to keep the program moving forward and not just surviving COVID transition, but thriving. And so if there you are, are up for just gathering behind me for a quick second just to show that power and that energy, I'd love for her to bring you up. Yes, please. page and also if you visit that table there are some packets there that leave the url um, but again every other thursday essentially is what it uh amounts to and you can join uh via a phone call just to come in or we will be eventually opening back up and be able to join by coming in in person as well we encourage the public to come to those meetings it it stimulates the conversation for the cannabis policy oversight team um, it stimulates their work i would also also say in addition to recruiting for CPOT members, we have three subcommittees as well that we are always looking to extend into the community. This is the first year that the subcommittees were really active and you can tell in the report. Um, it is representative of uh, a very diverse group of community members coming together to ensure that the cannabis program is successful. You didn't mind me slipping in no, here. No, come in, in, yes. <laughs> we have a question, yes. Okay, um, it's not a touch screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, will the one million dollar annual investment in seed continue in addition to the newly recommended programs? Absolutely. Uh, right now, we're very excited about that divestment from police uh, 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 allocation to the social equity and educational development or seed initiative. So that will continue and we're looking to expand that. Um, they mentioned the cannabis groups that are distributing the 1.3 million in relief fund um, have taken the stance. How, how would they not share? 
how these funds are being distributed. Um, what steps will the city of Portland take to ensure the transparent use of these taxpayer funds? Well, um, we are actually really excited how quickly we moved to get that out. We just opened the application February 1st. Um, disbursements are now being active. And I think once we are able to get a report, then that will be public information. Um, it makes it a lot easier to work with uh, community-based organizations, but they have to do the work. And so right now they're actively dispersing without really the ability to say who has gotten at this point. Um, anything else? Nope, that looks like it. Yeah. You are familiar with uh, OLCC licensure rules, it sounds like, is that right? Sure, yeah, a little bit on my training and experience. Um, in uh, August of 2016, I was um, assigned temporarily to be the sergeant of the marijuana program. And for, the, for a period of about a, a year to a year and a half, I was probably the only full-time law enforcement officer in the state <coughs> uh, dedicated solely to marijuana. I watched um, the um, uh, original Measure 91 all the way through the legislative process through uh, sessions in um, 2015 before I was appointed all the way up to uh, present day. Uh, I've, I've watched almost every piece of every bit of testimony of every marijuana related bill. So I'm very familiar with uh, the regulations. And so you're And so you're familiar with whether, um, I think that was, oh, all I was going to, well, the, the last question was the marijuana, the marijuana, marijuana and uh, the um, BH oil, the hash oil that was uh, recovered during the warrant, that was sent to the state crime lab for testing, is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe it was. Okay. Um, I have some. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that was Perfect. connected to your investigation. Yeah, and so what I'm going to do here is it's it's item E74, so I'm just going to look on the evidence forms and, and I'll be able to tell you which location that came from. Because uh, frankly it was in both places, um, in multiple places. came from and it's a sample from a separate item E57 that um, came from the back freezer room of uh, the the dispensary itself um, the ganja ganja which would be the location one or the I keep saying dispensary it's a um, medical marijuana program retailers are are called dispensaries and in the OLCC program they're called retailers. This was a neither because it wasn't licensed. It was more like a, a lemonade stand where you just open it up one day. Okay. So uh, yeah, from the back room uh, in the uh, uh, dispensary or retailer area. And was that the, the bud marijuana or the hash oil you just referred to? Uh, that was the, the um, the hash oil that I referred to. Um, I do. Thank you. And can you state and spell your name for us? My name is Tyler Bechtel. Last name is spelled B-E-C-H-T-E-L. And I'm a sergeant with Oregon State Police. And uh, you uh, also participated in this investigation of the Ganja Ganja and Trina's Treehouse businesses? I did. Okay. 
And what was your role um, prior to the search warrant being executed? Sure. Uh, so I supervised the uh, marijuana program within the state police, and uh, I supervised uh, uh, the detectives. Mm -hmm. Peterson's falsified records were used to convict citizens in court. Those false records were the basis for search warrant applications where Trooper Peterson misrepresented, by omission, the qualifications of his dog and its handler. He seized drugs that then disappeared. There is no record that the drugs were ever placed into evidence or destroyed. He denied defendants due process. He denied their right to an appropriate and honest inventory of any evidence and property. Numerous people remain in custody, on probation, or missing funds based on his fraudulent testimony and record-keeping. Um, a previous co-worker who was also in the same position that I was in. Um, was receiving complaints because it was we're as compliance specialists we were split up into different areas of the city um, so i believe that was her area of the city and had received complaints from um, other retail establishments one one being directly across the street um, that hadn't opened yet but was in the process of, of completing uh, their application and you know going towards licensing and so at the time that this complaint was received there was a, an existing complaint from an existing business or mm -hmm. a business that was about to open up. Did that complaint come from a business that was licensed? Uh, they hadn't been licensed yet, but um, we're going through the process. Mm -hmm. So your office received this complaint, and was that complaint, that business, associated with any specific person? Um, can you repeat that? Was that business associated or owned by a specific person? Um, well, the company that um, was was uh, Lamoda. Oh, pardon. Um, a previous coworker who was also in the same position that I was in um, was receiving complaints because it was we're as compliance specialists. We were split up into different areas of the city. Um, so I believe that was her area of the city and had received complaints from um, other retail establishments, one, one being directly across the street um, that hadn't opened yet, but was in the process of, of completing uh, their application and you know, going towards licensing. And so at the time that this complaint was received, there was a, an existing complaint from an existing business or mm -hmm. a business that was about to open up. Did that complaint come from a business that was licensed? Uh, they hadn't been licensed yet, but um, we're going through the process. Mm -hmm. So your office received this complaint, and was that complaint, that business, associated with any specific person? Um, can you repeat that? Was that business associated or owned by a specific person? Um, well, the company that um, was, was uh, Lamoda. Oh, pardon, I mean the, the other, the one that you received the complaint about. Oh, the like the owner there. of that business? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, yeah. Do you recall who that, who that was? Um, I believe her name was Rosa Casares. Was that uh, Lamoda? Yeah, she's, uh, her and her husband are Lamoda. And so you're telling us that the first complaint that you, the your office technically had was from Rosa Casares from Lamoda and her husband? From my knowledge, yes. Okay. So the dispensary that wants to open up at the prime location where I want to open up, mm -hmm. they're the first complaint you got? I believe so. Oh, uh -huh.
so we can catch the wind. Nothing I have but snow sailing. No tidal waves, no hurricanes.